Okay, um, feel free to stop me at any point if there's anything that we wanna go over a little more in depth. Um, this was a pretty, pretty weighty second half of the chapter. There's quite a bit of things in there. Certainly a lot of things that we can dig into a little bit more. Um, I do wanna thank Morgan for setting us up to this point. Um, I think he did a great job with the early explanations of regression and really laying the foundations for this chapter. So I'll also thank uh, Daniel Ledecky later on for some of his packages, the performance package and the GG effects package, which I'll use throughout uh, the later part of this. <clears throat> so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to start with a weighted regression. We're going to talk about using factors and dummy coding um, and then get into some assumption checking and some nonlinear models. So we'll start kind of in the middle. So we're talking about weighted regression initially. And what weighted regression does, it allows you to give certain variables or um, features more or less weighting. Uh, so the example they use in the book, I, I used a slightly different data set, um, but the same idea. I used the Ames housing data from the model data uh, package, which is part of the tidy models um, series of packages. And what I looked at is um, if I wanted to weight a regression, uh, you know, for example, in this uh, housing data set, I could weight the more recent sales. So I'm predicting sales price. This data set goes back to 2006. Some of the, the sales back then might, you know, be less uh, relevant than they are today. So I can use a weighting um, which is just take the year that it was actually sold, subtract 2006, um, and that'll give me a higher weighting for the more recent ones that were sold. And to show this uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see if I just do a linear regression, you can see what the, um, the, the variable or the uh, coefficients are. Um, and then you can see when, when we account for weight, what changes. Really, it doesn't seem like too much central air seems to be um, bringing a little bit more value now than it did back then. Um, and bedrooms will talk about a little less value um, than they did back then. We'll talk about why that's negative here in a little bit. Any questions on weighted regression before we move on? I don't see anything in the chat, so I'll just keep moving. All right, so uh, prediction using regression, one of the caution, cautionary tales that they use in the book is be very careful extrapolating results beyond the range of the data set. Uh, you can see with our uh, intercept term from before, uh, that was a negative value. Obviously, um, you're not gonna spend negative money to purchase a house. So because that's outside of um, the range of the data set, the extrapolation really isn't a good fit. So you need to be a little careful with that. Also the prediction intervals, um, the uncertainty around a single value, they use that twice. Once for the confidence intervals, which we've already talked about quite a bit in the text, which is around the statistic itself. But here we talk about the individual data point error. So there's always gonna be some error involved. As an example, if we filter, this housing data uh, for four bedroom, three bath with roughly 10,000 to 11,000 square foot lot, um, you can see the, the price varies uh, from 100,000 at the low level to 218,000, so it almost doubles. So that's quite a bit of uncertainty based on that one, um, or even, even though these are very similar houses, there's quite a bit of uncertainty on what the sale price will actually be. So that individual data point error will be pretty high. Uh, moving to factor variables. So uh, one of the factors I brought into this one is the building type. You can see there's five different levels, uh, one family home, two family connected home. I'm not sure why that's different than a duplex. Uh, but then there's a townhouse and a townhouse E, which I'm not entirely sure what that is. You can see the counts. Most of the houses in this data set are one family houses, um, but there's a few others in there. So the way we do this, um, we can, we can use dummy coding variables. So again, a dummy coded variable is when you use a zero or one to represent either something is or is not there. So when we look at the building type, um, for this example, I just used one row. 
Uh, this would say that this particular record or, or observation is a one family home. You can see there's zeros for everything else. Now there's two ways to do dummy coding. You can do one hot encoding, which is typically seen and used more when you're doing nearest neighbors or tree models, or you can use the, um, the P minus one method, which is usually what's represented in the regression. The way to determine which one you would use is if you include the intercept in the model itself, you really need to use a P minus one representation. What that means is you have a reference level that's not included in the model. Whereas one hot encoding, everything's included. Um, the reason that this, this occurs or why you would need to use P minus one is because otherwise you'd have collinearity issues because the intercept and the referent level could, could easily uh, be used to predict each other. The LM function and most linear regression models take this into account and just use the first factor as the reference level. So you can see when we include building uh, type in this linear regression, we only have four types of um, building types. So the one family home was used as a referent, which means that when we're interpreting this, this is based on the reference. So a two family home that's connected would expect to get uh, $38,000 less than a one family home. Or a duplex would expect to get, although um, probably different now, uh, almost 48,000 less than a one family home. So that's how you'd use that to interpret. And then if, if the factor vari variables themselves are ordered, um, the text did make a recommendation to treat those as a numeric value, as opposed to uh, a factor, because the factors will lose that ordering. So an example would be uh, Likert scale, right? Um, if you agree or disagree based on a scale of one to five, the difference between one and two is different than the difference between one and four, one and five. Um, so we want to, we want to maintain um, the, the ordering of those. So typically you would just keep it as a numerical value. Um, Likert's kind of an interesting one. Usually they say you need at least five um, in order for that to be treated as a numeric value. But other examples would be loan grades. Um, if a bank wants to loan and someone, you know, a grade of A, B, or C, or D, those matter, right? Those factorings matter. Crime rate might be another, another example of that, high, medium, low. Um, so that's factor variables. Uh, Andy, before you move on. Yes. Um, for the, the one hot versus P minus one, uh, if, you, if you have more than one factor variable, it sounds like then you pretty much have to do a P minus one kind of representation, right? Because then like if I have, if I have one factor variable for building type and, okay, I have to make this up. What's another factor variable that we might have in the same data set? Uh, neighborhood. Okay. So like if I can't do just one hot for both, even if I leave out an intercept, right? Because that still would give me collinearity issues. Is that correct? Um, if you if you left out the intercept or used a model that doesn't care about the intercept, like a tree model, um, I think you can do one hot for both. So that that wouldn't give me like redundant. It wouldn't because you would you would still have um, a value for the building type, right? Either a one or a zero um, for each of those. And you would have a different value for the neighborhood as ones or zeros. If I'm explaining that right, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. <clears throat> I'm, no, I'm just trying to, to understand in what cases. Um, the, to what, to what extent P minus one, um, with an intercept is to an extent that's equivalent to one hot without an intercept. I think I might just have to think about it more myself too. Like is it, an intercept term is like a, it's like an overall constant, right? And if I do, 
if I also have um, a one hot, then there's, uh, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to say this as I'm thinking about it. So I'm, I'm being precise in my thoughts. <clears throat> The uh, a one hot encoding case, be, it's kind of like because I know that uh, the sum of all the one hot columns will always be one. That's like a, a general. Con um, so now I'm thinking if I have two factor variables that I do one hot, even if I leave out the intercept, it's so like the sum of the building type columns mm -hmm. will always be one and the sum of the neighborhood type columns will always be one. Like, will that fact give me collinearity issues? The fact that the sum of this set of columns is always equal to the sum of that set of columns? I, I, I don't know if I have a strong enough intuition yet. I was, it was seeming to me that it would cause a problem, but I don't want to get us off on this, on a, on a side track here. No, I think I think that's a great question. I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Um, I don't I don't use one hot encoding very often, um, really at all. Um, but the way that conceptually I think about it is if if I want a a model to make a decision right between um, building types, let's say, where it is either this or this, um, like a tree model then I really need to have all building types in there, right? And I would also have to have all neighborhoods in there mm -hmm. because the absent of those, if we did a P minus one, um, that's not really helpful for the model because it basically takes information away from the model. Where, where regression, what I'm thinking about or this type of a model where we would use a P minus one is I really want that baseline and I wanna know what that is. So by using a P minus one, I have a referent for every factor variable. So I know it's, it's a one family building type in this neighborhood as the referent. And then I can interpret based on that. The, the discussion of removing the intercept, um, it makes the interpretability very difficult in my opinion. Um, but again, I don't, I don't play with one hot encoding all that often. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm gonna have to puzzle, think about it a bit more to make sure I, I kind of grasp you know, mathematically the distinction, but thanks for bringing that up or for I mean, your, your, your presentation of it was, was pretty clear. So I was, that raised the question in my mind. Yeah, so we're, we'll talk about collinearity here in a minute and maybe, maybe okay. there's something we could play around with um, to get through that. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to jump to interpreting regression equations, and there are a few different things that the, the book talked about, um, and I, I thought there was a neat package, the correlation package, to bring this in. This is a Gaussian graphical model to look at the correlated variables. So if you remember, and when we did the regression, it didn't really make sense that the number of bedrooms would be negatively associated, right? Because the more bedrooms you have, the more desirable your house is. Well, the reason that happened is because there's collinearity between the number of bedrooms and the total square footage, right? So as the bedrooms go up, you want the square footage to go up as well. Um, two homes that have the same total square footage, which is what we had when we were interpreting our regression, the one that has more but smaller bedrooms fetches a lower price. So there's some um, collinearity in the model itself which you can see by this Gaussian graphical model. The total square footage is fairly highly correlated with both the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. If we remove total square footage from the uh, linear regression itself, um, you can see the number of bedrooms now uh, basically becomes a indicator of the size of the house, right? Because we've removed total square footage. Whether or not we wanna do that is a different thing, but we see that this flips. So if a sign flips from negative to positive when we remove variables, that's a good indication of collinearity or an issue with that. Um, let's see if there's anything else. We can talk about that a little bit more. Multicollinearity is when you can use 
different predictors in the model to essentially mathematically determine an, a third one or a fourth one or whatever. So for, for this, um, the way I calculated total square footage is I just added first floor square footage and second floor square footage. If I include both of those in the model as well, we have a multicollinearity issue because you can um, calculate total square footage based on those other two predictors that are the models that are in the models, which means they're obviously highly correlated. The way R handles this, um, which I didn't actually realize until I read through this, but it basically if it finds a multicollinearity issue um, using the LM function, it basically removes one of them, right? So when we look at um, the tibble of the outcome, there's no second floor square footage. It basically just got rid of it because it realized there's a collinearity issue. So it's important to, or multicollinearity issue. It's important to understand that because this is obviously pretty unstable, right? Which one it's gonna remove. I'm sure there's a reason it removes the second, not the first. Um, but we want this to be explicitly stated in our function. We wanna be able to make sure that we don't have this, this multicollinearity issue. Um, so that's kind of including too many variables in, right? The other um, spectrum is confounding variables, or it's, it's a problem of omission when we don't include a variable that is important to the data. So here we can, we can bring in the neighborhood. Um, when we bring in the neighborhood, which was a confounder, um, And we do the same regression, but we keep this neighborhood group. There, there were a lot of neighborhoods, so I just grouped them um, basically into, into five different neighborhoods. I don't, I don't know exactly how they grouped out. Um, but when I looked at each group based on the sales price or, or the, the median sales price, um, I think I use median, hopefully, yeah, median um, sales price. I did a residual thing, um, but the idea is here that when we look at the neighborhood groups, we can see that group one compared to group five, group five sells for almost $102,000 more than group one. Um, you know, group two is 17,000 more, group four is 46,000 more on average. So neighborhood certainly has a play into the sales price. So it's a confounding variable and it should be brought in um, as a predictor to our model. Another thing to look at would be the interactions. So we have main effects, which is when we explicitly say, um, you know, the lot area, the bedrooms above ground, the number of baths, central air or not. And then we have interactions where we use the way this is represented in R is with a multiplication uh, asterisk here. So neighborhood group times the total square footage. So I just use that as a interaction term. And what that does is it includes both of those as main effects. So we can see in the outcome, we still have the neighborhood groups and we still have uh, total square footage. Those are included as main effects, but then we also have the interaction term, which is neighborhood group two by total square footage, neighborhood group three by total square footage. What this means, if we see that these are statistically significant, which we could talk about that, um, if we really want to. But if these are statistically significant, it means we can no longer really interpret the main effects because the, the way that these interact are different at different levels, okay? So um, if I graph this out, which again, this is neighborhood group oops, um, and sales price, what we see is that the lower square footage, so under a thousand uh, square foot, with the exception of group one, it's fairly constant. Even in, even out um, in group five, you're not really changing all that much. But if you look at homes that are closer to 2,000 square feet, the um, as you change neighborhood groups, the uh, the slope changes pretty drastically. So higher square footage. Um, it varies by group different than lower square footage varies by group. This is typically something you would see when you include binary variables. Um, usually if you're looking at differences in um, sex assigned at birth, right? Males, females, uh, 
they typically will do this as an interaction term because it might the 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 dependent variable might change based on uh, the factor level. So that's what we're seeing here. These become really painful uh, when you're trying to interpret it. Really, the only way to interpret it, in my opinion, is to look at it graphically to see what, what the interaction is and why does it look so different. Any questions on the, or actually, um, the book does talk about when you select interaction terms and determine which ones should be interactions, obviously prior knowledge um, and in, any intuition you have that things might be different at different levels. You can use stepwise regression to kind of sift through the variables. You could certainly use a penalized regression or a weighted um, regression to automatically fit the variable, a large set of variables. Um, but generally, if you use tree models, you don't really have to worry about the interaction as much um, because those search for optimally, optimal interaction terms already. But with a regression, we have, to, we have to really think meaningfully about that. And by doing like bivariate type um, analyses and just looking at um, the way they interact, you can kind of tease these out. It just takes a little bit of time. Hey, can you scroll up a minute again, Andy? I want to see. Yeah. So, yeah, right there. So it looks like the way that uh, R is doing this, because I see neighborhood groups two, three, and four, five, but it's like doing a, a, a P minus one thing on the neighborhood group, right? It's Correct. Not, so when it just, when it's so, I'm trying to think the way I should understand this total, the total SF row there, that's like, in some ways I can think of that, like that's the coefficient for neighborhood group one colon total SF and right. And then the, the ones below it, neighborhood group two, three, four with total SF, that's, that's how much I need to, that's how much that coefficient gets modified for those other neighborhood groups. Right? So, yes, that is correct. Yep. Yeah, so, so the way, the way I would interpret is that um, total square footage um, when the neighborhood group is one, right. Add $67 essentially to this. And if, the if the neighborhood group is two, then it's really 67 minus about six. Or, so it's like, you know, it's going to be 62 is the coefficient for that neighborhood group. Yes, but you have to first interpret the interactions themselves um, before you look back at the main effects. So it's not quite as clean, but generally, yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, and and the reason so the the reason I say that because that's not technically um, the p value is not significant. Um, then really there's no difference between total square foot group one and total square foot group two. Ah, right. Good point. Right. Um, you don't really start seeing an actual difference until uh, group four and group five. Yes. And, you, and that kind of makes sense because, I mean, the change in the coefficient is also getting more substantial. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right, so I don't know if, if you guys get into these like Twitter um, threads that I just keep getting um, like a ton of ad, not ads for, but different uh, tweets for that, that show up, but I've been hearing a lot about the performance package by Daniel Ludecki. Um, so I thought I would try it out for some of the regression diagnostics. I thought it was a really great tool um, and it seems pretty good. So I'll introduce it a little bit here as we talk and hopefully I get it right. Um, I won't, that guy's a genius. <laughs> I don't know who he is, but um, he's a genius. So the first type of diagnostic we want to look for is an extreme value, right? An outlier. I do want to caution that an outlier is not necessarily an influential case. So just because something's an outlier, it doesn't mean it throws your model off, right? That, that depends a lot on the sample size. It depends a lot on um, how much leverage it actually has. In a, in, a, in a host of other things. Um, so you gotta be a little bit careful with that. In general, Cook's distance is a good way to test for influential cases, not necessarily outliers again. If we did a box plot, we would see a lot more outliers 
Um, but what Cook's distance does is it looks at the amount of leverage it has towards the model and also the size of the standardized residuals. So using the performance package and the, the, um, the function check outliers for our model, um, this shows one outlier. So case number 1499, row number 1499 um, is just outside of, uh, it, it's just a little bit too influential and it throws the model off according to this. You can also use other um, different ways to look at it. You, you could look at certainly the Z-score um, or the interquartile range, then you get a lot more outliers, um, but not necessarily influential cases. So the way to check if this is an influential case or not is to remove it from the data set um, and then run the regression again. Uh, so when we do this, you can see there's, there was only one outlier uh, based on Cook's distance and it was uh, row 1499. So when we look at this, uh, row 1499 basically said it was a sales price of 160,000, but the square footage was almost a 6,000 square foot house. Um, three bedroom, four and a half bath, 63,000 square foot lot area, so a pretty big location. So you could see um, it probably is just kind of an abnormality thing uh, without digging into what actual house it was. We don't really know much about it um, or why it sold for so little. So when we, we remove this influential case, um, you can see the things that change. Um, and again, you have to figure out how much they change, but the total square footage goes from adding $104,000 to the sales price, adding $109,000, right? So it seems to move quite a bit. Number of baths becomes slightly less uh, different and the lot area, um, you know, kind of marginal differences. So looking at non-influential places, if you pull it out and it changes, really if it changes the significance, um, if you're looking at more of a, uh, statistical way of looking at this, if it changes the significance and you know it's a it's a uh, influential case and it should be removed. If it doesn't change it at all, then usually um, the recommendation typically is to leave it in. Obviously, the more data that you have, the bigger the data set, the less influential a case will be. Uh, using the performance package, we could do a very simple, this is, this is what really turned me out of this um, package or this, um, this package is just the check model function. So you do that and it throws up six different things. It checks for linearity, um, which we can see there's a few things out here on the higher end of the value that are pulling it down that should be a flat line. Um, so we, we, we might have some linearity issues in this model. The uh, heterogeneity or homogeneity of variance, we wanna see is that the variance at the lowest level is the same as the variance at the highest level. So this should be flat and horizontal as well. We can see that there's obviously a lot more variance um, higher out. So the higher the sales price, um, the less predictive this, this particular model is going to be. Uh, this shows collinearity. So if we have any of, any of the variables that are in there that are up around 10, um, you know, then there's some big time collinearity issues. Here we don't see that, so that's good. We have our influential observations, um, and in red you can see 1499. The normality of residuals, so one of the things with linear regression is that we want the residuals again to be a, rel a, a normal curve, essentially. Um, and these bottom two show that it's, it's okay, right? We use the ocular test, we kind of close our eyes a little bit. Um, and you can see in the middle of, of the, the range or the middle of the mean here, the medium, it's predicted fairly well at a normal uh, curve type level. But as you get out towards the edges, um, the model starts or, or the data starts getting off of our line here. Um, so these are things that we can look at going forward, but generally um, these are some of the assumptions that you would wanna check with a linear regression. Uh, like I said, so this, the linearity shows that this might be a non-linear non uh, model might fit these data a little bit better. Um, so we can look at a couple different things. Uh, here is the predicted sales price just based on total square footage. 
Um, you can see when we fit a, a linear model to this, uh, as it gets higher and higher square footage, um, the sales price goes all over the place. There's some low values uh, here around 200,000 and there's some high values closer to 700,000 or 800,000. So our model is not gonna do quite as well there. Um, and also the, the linear model, it might work, but you can kind of see in the middle range in the 2,000 to 3,000 square foot range, um, the, the values tend to be a little bit higher than the line. Um, and in the lower range, maybe a little bit lower. So we might have some, some issues where this is not really all that linear. Another way to look at this in particular, because again, this is just total square foot to sales price. One of the things we might wanna look at is the partial residual plot. What that means is it basically accounts for the other predictors that are in the model. Um, this one doesn't show, it doesn't change all that much. Um, but when we account for that, it just, it adjusts these, the sales price just a little bit. Um, so, so it holds everything else or account, it accounts for all the other variables that are in there, but it still gives us a nice um, scatter plot to be able to look at our model. If we fit a uh, local polynomial regression line, so just a low as like a smooth uh, line, which is what this blue line is, we can see that our model does not do very well at um, modeling these data as well as that does. So we might have a, a, a nonlinear model. Those are all good indicators. The first thing we can do is look at a polynomial. Um, so all we're gonna do is just square. Um, and I just use total square footage. So we put that in as a polynomial term as well. Um, and you can see when we do that, our linear prediction line, this black line, uh, starts to have a touch of a uh, being pulled down, right? As you get up to 5,000 uh, total square feet. So it's getting a little bit closer to this uh, polynomial um, Loas line. So we're doing better. We can also do a spline regression, which is, which is what I think a lot of people do. Um, so that basically divides the data set into multiple bins. Um, they call these knots and it creates a separate fit at each bin. So what I did is just took the total square footage um, and just basically broke it up into uh, quantiles, right? The, the lowest, the middle and, and the highest, um, and then fit the spline regression on each of those. And when I did that, you can see we're getting closer, right? It's still, still looking pretty good. At the lowest square foot level, um, we, start, we start getting away from the data a little bit. But we're starting to do a little bit better job um, capturing both the highs at like the 4,500 square foot and the lows at 5,000 square feet. The hard part about uh, spline regression is knowing what bins, right? How many bins, how many knots, wh wh where does that go? Um, so the generalized additive model um, is a way to uh, automate that essentially. So the MGCV package does this GAM model for us um, and it uses that total uh, square footage um, and it, it basically determines the knots that are appropriate for that. And with that, we get a little bit closer. Again, um, we're getting closer. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's kind of the nonlinear regression um, overview that they, that they provided. And that's, that's the rest of the chapter. Um, so pending any questions or further discussion that, that you guys have, um, I think that's about as far as I've got. That was really great. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, you're welcome. That was, that was a really nice summary of the rest of the chapter. It was a pretty meaty chapter, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I um, I started looking at it. I was like, oh, weighted regression. Okay, that's good. And then, oh, assumptions. I hate those. Okay, that's good. Oh, man. <laughs> Nonlinear. Okay, now we're getting crazy. I, I've been really uh, happy with this book and how well they, they break everything down and they don't get too deep into the statistics side. And just just keep it like what's important. What are the important parts of it? Um, yeah, I like that too. Yeah. Good. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat. So unless anybody else has anything, uh, I'm going to try to get this 
into uh, John or Tan's hands to get it up on the um, on the web there for us. So hopefully these notes will be out there soon. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. All right. You're welcome. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.